Ladies and gentlemen, welcome or welcome back to the Electric Vibe podcast. I am Kurt Hoffman, your co-host, and my smooth brother from another mother is... I am J. David Silva, the Electric Man. Electric Man. Before you begin, uh, when we were getting our special guest on uh, making arrangements, stuff like that, I sent him a little thing because he's very much he he likes to know exactly where you're going to send links and stuff like that so i like to cut it up with him because we've got established and we'll reveal who our guest is but i think this is going to set things up nicely and he just sent me a thing that said oh shit getting in now <laughs> okay here we go i said i'm gonna send it to... oh wait a minute yes, can you sir, hear that I'm gonna send yeah. it to... i said i'm gonna send it to... yes sir i'm gonna send it to... Wherever the word passes to brother Reverend Wright Dixon. Did that whole thing come through or did I? No, it came through. Yeah. Okay. And then this was the response that I got. <clears throat> Deacon, Deacon Hoffman. Listen, you got the good Reverend Dixon here. Uh, look here. I just need you to know that the Lord has put it on me to respond to your message. So guess what? I'm looking forward to being on Electric Vibe with you and Brother J. David Silver. We looking forward to it. All right? Now don't y'all start playing no games now. <laughs> Cause the Lord <laughs> sees everything. And everything that the Lord sees. Okay, I will just stop. Oh, and ladies and gentlemen, he has found his way into the green room, but we're gonna do a little intro first. Jay, can you take it away, please? Yes, I can. With that dynamic and hilarious opening, I think <laughs> that people can probably guess that our guest today is none other than Damon Dixon, the extraordinarily talented and um, dynamic individual dancer who uh, was an integral part of the new power generation with Prince and spent his career has spent his career entertaining people all across the world. Um, and I think people just got a little taste of that entertainment and the good time that Damon likes to have. The Electric Vibe is honored and pleased to welcome Damon Dixon to our podcast episode today. All right. Damon, sir, yes, sir. how are you today? How do we find you? How are you doing? Hey, man, I'm good, man. I'm, uh, you know, blessed just trying to stay, you know, incognito and in my uh, witness protection program. So as you can see, you can't really tell where I'm at. That's what that's the good thing about witness protection. Is don't nobody need to know your location in a, in a secret lair in the in this fortress of solitude. We'll call it the fortress solitude. of solitude. How about that? Right. You know. Gilbert, right. well, look, Gilbert said I, I was living at the uh, Purple Rain house when I talked on this other podcast, and I was like, oh, boy, you're just giving out locations now. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> Have, now, now, wait a minute. You bring up the Purple Rain house. Okay. You've been in that since the Airbnb? No, you, you know what? Actually, I've never really seen the house. On Snelling Ave, I've actually seen it in person before they did the whole Airbnb zhuzhing it up and all that crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've never seen it. Yeah. Even when we were, you know, what you know, we were extras in Purple Rain, so we didn't really chance to go over there and that kind of stuff. But I've right. never seen the house before or after. Yeah, I saw it from the outside. I know he he didn't always own it, even during the filming of Purple Rain. But I think years before he passed, he had actually bought the house. He owned it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, listen, I also found out from uh, a previous guest that we had on that he had bought a bunch of houses in and around Chanhassen and would put people up there. They had no idea that they had a house ready for them to be put up in. Yeah, that, that's the story the, I heard, too, and I, that, that he had a lot of property uh, in a diff, lot of different areas up there. So, it, you know, it's... He was, you know, I mean, it's just Prince. I, yeah. I believe he was in in good faith and good heart to want to do that kind of stuff. Sure. And, and, yeah. and then the fact that he was trying to keep people from being around Paisley Park. He wanted that to just be a an area where he has his thing. Well, I know when we had rehearsals and then we had them after parties, we'd get the police come and say, well, you know, what they're saying it's too loud out here and blah, blah, blah. It's like, ain't nobody over here. Ain't nobody, ain't no neighbors. 
Wouldn't have said that. Wouldn't have said that to you if the Bee Gees had owned it. Right. Let's just let's just that part. Okay. That can part, I, can, yeah. can we call that? Can we call that part out? <laughs> you know what? Partying they, while, par, you know they say driving while black. You was partying while black. There. I'm, I'm while just gonna black, say yeah, it. It's said. Real. I said what for I said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey. So sorry, Jay. Please. I, yeah, I, no, I, no worries at all. You know what, Damon? Obviously, you know we we want to talk about your career and the time that you spent in the new power generation. But let's take it a step back. Can you take us back to your upbringing? Talk about what it was like growing up in Lubbock, and then how you transitioned into the purple world, so to speak. Okay. Um, well, born and raised in Lubbock, um, I was uh, uh, one of the four children. Uh, I have three sisters, and they're all younger than me, so I'm the oldest. Uh, um, being born there, uh, you know, the house that we lived in, I, I kid you not, it was more like a shotgun little home thing. Okay. Uh, I remember growing up in, in in that area. We, you know, it was it was uh, interesting because, in, in, in a lot of people will notice, and I'm probably uh, when I'm finished with the book, everybody will get the whole story. But um, you know, I'm trying to get this book about my life. It started too. My aunt, who is my dad's sister, who was also married to my mother's brother, <laughs> if that yeah, makes I'm, sense. Yeah, oh, yeah. that dot. Yep, connecting. So, we live right next door to them. Okay. So growing up, I grew up with my first, you know, my cousins, my my first cousins and stuff. And, you know, it was just normal childhood thing, man. We, you know, we in a little country town. There's a big open field across the street from us, and school was right down the street. And there's a lot of little stories that go along with that part of it. And I won't get into all of them because, you know, that's coming out in the book when I start writing all of this stuff and getting it all, all right. together. Um, but uh Growing up in, in Lubbock, we I think we left Lubbock, um, ironically, in a storm. Uh, it was a tornado coming. It was full rain and the whole nine. And my dad was like, we were moving to, you know, Minnesota. I didn't know anything about that. I think I was probably nine or 11. And uh, we got to Minnesota and it was wintertime. I didn't know what winter was because we didn't experience winter down in Texas like that. Mm -hmm. And pulled up to this lady's house who was dating my uncle and, and got out the car with no shoes on and thinking, you know, what is this stuff? Like white sand. Well, quickly found out it was cold. <laughs> and I was like, what the heck? So we wind up moving up there and uh, we kind of, I mean, we lived there for a while uh, going back and forth. Uh, so until we got settled, um, we were back and forth from Minneapolis to to Texas every other year. And it was just one of them things. And then in 1975, we wind up staying uh, in Minnesota. You know, my last stint being in Lubbock was eighth grade, I think 73 or 74. Mm -hmm. And I was playing basketball and I thought I was, you know, really good. I, I ain't gonna say I thought I was. I'm gonna put my arrogance out there. I was a hell of a motherfucking basketball player. I can play baseball, basketball, and football. I was just athletic. Let's just put it out there. You know, and anybody wanna challenge that, they can come on. We can play anytime. Do they wanna play with but, Damon or do they wanna play uh, with look, Damien? Look, <laughs> no, they're playing with Damon, because Damon, you know, Damon had all the talent. He didn't want to bring Damien out because then you won't get to play. Right. <laughs> uh, just keep it real. <laughs> no, I, I I I grew up playing ball and, and sports and stuff. So um eighth grade, you know, before we moved back to Minnesota in seventy five, um, won a championship at this school, got back to Minnesota, um, didn't play high school ball my ninth grade year. Felt like the coaches were playing favoritism to some cats that I grew up with knowing mm. there at the time and mm -hmm. You know, they were supposed to be better than me mm -hmm. um, and just didn't play my ninth grade year. Well, played some guys for intramural basketball during lunchtime, and I played mm -hmm. some of the guys that were on the team. I played five guys by myself because my team was scared to play them, and I wind up winning. Okay? That's how right. that's how bad I was. Okay? okay. And you didn't and have to serve I, them pancakes either. You know, and the coach is like, well, you ought to come on out to the team. I'm like, no, 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 I'm good, man. Y'all go ahead. I'll wait till my uh, sophomore year. And that's when I actually play, started my career playing high school ball. 
Now, wow. before the whole Prince thing came along, I was playing basketball, playing football. That, that was what I thought I was going to make it in. That's what I thought I was going to go to college, get me a degree and play NBA basketball is what I was looking forward sure. to. Sure. Didn't happen. Had a kid in high school my senior year. And that turned down, kind of changed everything. So, mm. you know, um, after I, I graduated high school in 79, uh, my son was born. A mm. couple years went by. Uh, had some stuff happen with my family. My mother was, uh, was ill. Um, had an unfortunate incident that happened with her. Um, um, and, and, you know, domestic abuse type stuff. Mm. And it kind of deterred me from wanting to play, go to college, because I was trying to go to college. I was still trying to go to like a, a, a junior college to, you know, still try sure. to, my hand at playing basketball. Sure. And that didn't happen. Um, wind up moving in with my girlfriend um, at the time who I have two kids with. Uh, and that's when the whole thing came about, about the whole getting up, being a part of, you know, Purple Rain. Oh, wow. Um, Tony, I, I read trying to tell people's names and this stuff, but Tony was the person that came and asked me about dancing because he, you know, back in the day when we were in high school, we used to have, you know, a disco over at the park, which was North mm -hmm. Commons Park. We used to play, we used to dance over there. Uh, mm -hmm. On the weekend, they had little, little, you know, discos. DJ come in and spin records and you be in the gymnasium, everybody getting their groove on. Well, that's where he had remembered me from, you know, and he, he was going to North at the time. And he was like, Hey man, I, I know you still dance. You want to go out and, uh, you know, try to go down the first Avenue and get in this contest. And I'm like, uh, so yeah, I mean, I haven't did it in a while, but you know, we can check it out, you know, and we wind up going down there and that's how the opportunity came about us being, uh, in Purple Rain. So going from being in Texas, a small town, you know, country food and moving to Minnesota and then mm. high school train, you know, the whole life change thing growing up and having a kid in high school and missing opportunities to do something else mm. that I thought I was going to do. Yeah, I, I, the opportunity came for us to do that. And, and we went down to First Avenue and uh, actually won that contest, I think, three or four weeks in a row. And we got knocked wow. off, ironically, by Kirk and his group. <laughs> right. Because you weren't the Game Boys at that point because Kirk wasn't part of it. You were, well, what were we you weren't called the Game again? Boys. Uh, the group that we, well, me and Tony called ourselves uh, To Be Rude. Okay. And yeah. Kirk had a group called V Train. Right. And right. so that's how we actually met Kirk. But I had met Kirk through uh, family members, uh, the girl that I was dating. Well, the, her, her brothers were musicians around the city, so they played with, you know, Jerome and uh, uh, with uh, uh, Prince and, and Jerome and all them guys. That that whole scene, the the band scene, they played against them guys. They were part of some of them groups, you know, and nobody really talked about them. Um, brother named uh, Randy Barber, who was a guitar player and an incredible singer. Mm. Uh, his brother Michael Barber, who lived down in Texas, these guys had a band too. And they had Joe Lewis. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Joe Lewis. Yes. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember Batman, David Island. Mm -hmm. They they were with all these guys. Wow. They played with all these guys. Um, and I met Kurt. It's so funny. I was helping their band um, bring their equipment in to this place. And I saw this little this kid. At the time, Kurt was quite a bit. He was younger than me. I was like, I'm 60, 63. Kurt's getting ready. I think he just hit 60. Mm -hmm. And I see this kid over here behind some bongos. And I'm going, what the hell is that little boy? And what is he doing in here? And it was one of them, it was one of them clubs over south in a in a in a small mm -hmm. little old building. And it was Kirk. His mother brought him to play with Randy and them. And I'm wow. like, Wow. And this dude's been playing now, like I said, he's been playing <laughs> percussions and drums and stuff since he was like, I want to say nine. You that's know? a hit, you know, that's that part of history. So I'm sure you're familiar with or you're not if you're not that the uh, uh, got to be something here, the book that Andre Swenson wrote about, and all those clubs that 
you know, you had to play in because you couldn't go on the other side of town. Yeah, exactly. And that was one of them places. It was just a small hole in the wall place, but they played. But uh, that's how I met Kurt. And yeah. and then years later, like I said, we doing the dance contest. I saw him again. And I'm like, I know this dude, you know, so we're all dancing around and then got that opportunity to to be in Purple Rain mm -hmm. was just, you know, surreal. You just don't, you know, it's like you Minnesota's not that big. People think it's that big, but it's not that big, especially in the black community. So, right. you know, um, wind up meeting Kurt and we all did the little dance thing and hey, history was made after that. I mean, the Game Boy stuff didn't come along till 1990. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You yeah. know, we we winded up putting together a group after Purple Rain because we you know thought we were gonna go on the road on Purple Rain. Mm -hmm. That never happened. Um, right. Right. He called us out there quite a bit. He gave he dangled the carrot in front of us a few times. Yep. You know, hey, y'all want to go on the road? Psych. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. It's funny. He said it that way. Y'all want to go on the road? We're like, yeah, man. Psych. It's like <laughs> for real, dude. So that's when we knew, you know, we we were on to something because we kind of, you know, we kind of got called here and there after Purple Rain. Um, we did go to the premiere when it had uh, Purple Rain in Hollywood. Okay. And we were thought we were going to go, we thought we were going to be in, in, you know, be able to go to see the movie firsthand. Yeah. And then we yeah. got that call while we were at the hotel. And he's like, hey, we, you know, uh we're still on because we were going to do the after show. We we're supposed to do the yeah. after party and lip sync Erotic City. That I was just going to bring that up. You got to pre you guys visually premiered that song. Yes. Yes. And the girl we, with the two strips of tape or whatever it was, uh, not even yeah, pissed. We, so so <laughs> it was too funny because, you know, we got called and said we were, you know, going to go to Hollywood and do this do this song. He wanted us right. to lip sync this, this new song that he was doing. And we hadn't heard the mm -hmm. song yet. Right. And we were, this was before Paisley Park. And we were out in, out in it was Flying Cloud Drive is where the, the right. studio was the that they rehearsed yeah. at. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a warehouse district. Right. And we went out there. You know, he presented us with the song. We're, we're listening to it. He said, yeah, this is going to be the song. We want y'all to lip sync to it, blah, 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 blah. You know, we took the song, went home, rehearsed, you know, what we could. And at the time, there was four of us. Um, there was a brother named Everett Kimbrough, um, who was also in Purple Rain, who also we had, you know, got an opportunity to work with. Him, Kurt, myself, Tony, and a guy named Scott March, who was... Uh, the security out at Paisley right now. He, well, he was. I, after, I don't know what's mm. going on out there now since they fired a bunch of people, supposedly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Scott Mark, a lot of people don't know that Scott Mark was one of the guys that was in Purple Rain with us. Huh. So no, I, they I, see, I, him at the, see him out there at Paisley as security, but they don't know he was one of the dancers in Purple Rain. I have you been know. in touch with him at all, uh, Damon, recently? Have you talked Who, to Scott? him? Scott? Yeah. Yeah, I, I talked to Scott once in a blue moon. We don't talk a lot. I talked to Pat more. Pat was the other guy that was in Kirk's group. Pat Scott okay. and, and 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 uh and and Kirk was uh V train. Okay. You know, so they they winded up breaking things off. Uh I think Pat went on to do something different. Pat's an absolutely amazing musician as well. So we'll I'll touch on him another time. But um yeah. We broke things off. They 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 winded up going different ways. Kurt started dancing with his brother Everett, you know. But anyway, let's get back to after we you know found out that he wanted us to go out to Hollywood and premiere this song. He tells us he's like, yeah, so you guys are gonna lip sync this song and we're gonna get you guys in some of the, the wardrobe like in Purple Rain. We all got these the special made hand suits that was just like <laughs> stuff he wore in Purple Rain, and we're. In Hollywood, so they give us the call and tell us we're not able to go to the premiere of the movie. We're like, oh, that sucks, you know. So, but you know, you guys be ready. We're gonna have send a car to pick you up and bring you there for the uh, after party and da da da. We're like, right. cool. Okay. We get there. We do the give ready to do show. Now we were told this girl. We rehearsed with this girl. I to this day I can't remember her name, but she was. Let's just say she was fire. She was. <laughs> Hella fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> we at the rehearsal, we're, you know, going through the whole motion. She's she's doing all the girl vocals and we'd like checking her out. She's interacting with us. We get there to do the show. <laughs> it's time for us to go on stage. We go out there, we're all, you know, all in our little shit. We're like, it's gonna happen, man. Get on the stage, the lights come up, song kicks in, we're doing all our stuff, and here comes the girl walking on the stage on the girl part, and she got on a pair of bikini bottoms with two strips of tape across her chest. <laughs> and uh. now, mind you, we gotta be professional, right? <laughs> <laughs> You can fuck it to the dawn, make it look like Jerry Dawn. A lot of shit, can't you see? <laughs> I mean, you, can't look like, it <laughs> you talk about surprise. It was like, holy shit. Is you this keep all your eyes on the prize, not get distracted, look, right? So, Look, stop. Everybody, I, I know we weren't the only ones that were shocked. So, I'm sure. You know, of course, all these celebrities are there and they're asking us questions after we get done. When y'all putting that out? We're like, that's not our song. Man. <laughs> we're just lip syncing. So I guess we did a good enough job that they thought we were singing it. I mean, did you, you know? even have enough information, Damon, that Sheila was on the vocals or any of those details? You didn't know anything I, other than I, the song. You know what? I don't. We were just presented the song. I had right. no clue who was on who the was vocals. Doing what? Who okay. All I know is he presented it. So we assumed it was, you know, he wrote all of it. Okay. Okay. You know what I mean? I I, I don't. Right. That, back then, it wasn't. You know, we weren't trying to find out who wrote the you, lyrics, wrote the lyrics, and wrote it. And we didn't do that. We just we were hired to come down yeah. and come put this, pull this off, and we did. You know. Well, it was like a need to know Damon, basis. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, James. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Damon. I'm I'm curious because you said that Tony had had asked you to to come out and and audition over at first Avenue, but can we just take a step back and can you t talk a little bit about how dancing came now? I'm, I'm assuming it came naturally to you. And c can you talk about how that worked? Yeah. I I've been dancing since I was little Jay. I was man. My mom now let my mother would tell it. I was two years old and that time any music came on, I didn't care if it was blues, R and B, whatever I'd be dancing. And you know, babies don't dance. Like, you know, Baby, you hold their hand and they just doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she said I've been doing that since I was little. So as time went on, I got a little older. You know, I, I love music. I would watch American Bandstand, Soul Train, all these shows. And then we had family reunions on my dad's side. And every time I went to those, we, you know, we always had a night where everybody came to together at one of my uncle's spots. And we drink they you know older older couples of you know they had their drinking and you know they're doing their christian brothers and they ham beer <laughs> and all this and the kids is just running around well i didn't want to run around with the kids i was trying to be in there where they were playing the music so i was always dancing and i remember being asked to come dance because they couldn't get none of the kids to come you know you know mm -hmm. entertain them so to speak mm -hmm. and then they go get day day they don't come in here and dance sure enough they called me in there. They said, we give you some money to dance. That's all it took. I was in, Jack. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> they put the yeah. music on. I'm, I'm I'm, mimicking James Brown. I'm doing all these mm. songs, and I'm dancing. I'm doing the splits. I'm, you know, the whole nine. So dancing was always just in my blood. I yeah. never took no formal lessons. Yeah. I just was easy to pick up stuff that I saw. Sure. Sure. You know, so that's how dancing was for me. I mean, I never took no classes. I I, no classical stuff, none of that stuff. So, well, like when we had you on as a tribute to Cat, <clears throat> you come yeah. from a, a, a very similar background to that, where you just had this natural ability. Um, yeah, I don't remember she mentioned that she was athletic or was in athletics. I don't think she was, but she was a lot big into the club scene. You yeah. know, yeah. What, what you did when you, you know, when we didn't have social media and our phones to distract ourselves was us of a certain generation went outside. Yeah. Went physically to a club to dance and to socialize and stuff. We didn't get on phones and yeah. just sit there and chat with people all day long. Yeah, yeah. This the whole this generation is different from what we had. I yeah, mean, you can say that again. You know, we didn't have phones. We didn't have that. So we outside playing. So when it came to going stuff, you physically went to a nightclub and and yep. get your groove on. I mean, yeah. That was just how it was back then. And I know when we used to go to the club, we'd leave the club. Our clothes would be soaking wet. 
Mm-hmm. From dancing, from the time we get there to the night till they said last, you know, last song, we still out there on the floor doing our thing. So yep. it was just an upbringing of how we were, you know, and it, I mean, our dedication to dance just stemmed from that, you know what I mean? Who are your favorite musical artists that you like oh, to, to dance to and stuff like that? Jesus you know? Christ, to dance to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what what was the song that got you? Oh man, oh shit! Get, get clear the way. Oh Demons my coming God! On the floor. No, it was just all the old songs, the old old band, man. The Sun, the Lakeside, the you know, so sure. the Gap bands. It, it, oh, them, them, wow. them were the songs. Them were the things that we were listening to growing up. You know what I mean? And then at my earlier age, it was James Brown, Otis mm-hmm. Redding, you know, Aretha Franklin, mm-hmm. you know, Stevie. You know, oh, them were all the people that we, you know, that we were listening to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember being a little kid. I think I was might have been 11, 11 or 12. Mm-hmm. James Brown came to Minnesota. He played at the Minneapolis uh, Orchestra, the Orchestra Hall. Yeah. And I went to that concert and I was ecstatic because that's who I was watching as a kid dance. And... So my mom then was like, hey, James Brown going to be here. We're going to take you to this concert. I was like, oh, oh my God, man. you really going to go see James Brown? And that was incredible for me. So I, I was at that concert. And then years later, um, speaking mm-hmm. with Tony, um, I found out he, he was there. Sure. Well, James yeah. brought some kids up on stage. Sure. I was too far up in the balcony, so I couldn't get down there. Yeah, but Tony not. said he was one of the kids that got a chance to go up there. Oh, and I went, wow. you're kidding me, right? I'm like, you motherfucker, you. <laughs> Ain't <laughs> that uh, uh, <laughs> What what year was that, Damon? What year did you see James? Um, late that 60s? had to be uh, early seventy. Okay, so this is by that point you got the JBs. You don't have the fabulous flame, so you got you got right, Bootsy, I, I, I Catfish, got real, yeah, yes, Jabo yes. Starks is in there. Well, he had two or three drummers. You know, he had a percussion orchestra. Jesus, I mean, right, right, right. It was early seventies. That was early seventies. Oh. I mean. You know, the big and, and like I said, and all I was like shit. 11 or 12 years old. That dude was like, man, James was just, for me, it was like him dancing and that, that whole little, man, I, sure. I was like, I was killing it, Jack. I was like, Whoa. <laughs> that was real dance, Jack. And then when he bend and hit that split and come up real, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. dude, it was on. I was trying to learn everything he did, everything. Yeah. Was it still like the old style where he had the, all the opening acts, the comedians, and all that stuff? Did you get well, to witness no, that part? Um, of it? I don't remember any comedians. It was no his review show, or anything. So... It wasn't like his old review shows back in the. Yeah. You know what yes, I'm talking about? Old yeah. reviews, yes. Yeah. Yes. Damon, we were talking about obviously what happened in Purple Rain and, and obviously going out for that audition, um, the contest at First Avenue. What was the first time you actually met Prince? Ah. Um, I actually, we didn't meet, we just was in passing. He came to North High uh, to get his transcripts of what I understood to, because he was transferring to another school. Um, and I don't know what it was for. I I, I, can't, I just know he was there. He was coming there to get something. But him, Dez, and Andre walked in, you know, North High. And this was right around that Dirty Mind album. Mm-hmm. And this dude walks in and he has on that whole, the bandana, the trench coat, yep. the long yeah. boot shoes and, and the Speedo underwear thing. And I'm playing, you know, I'm, I'm playing sports. Me and the whole, all the jocks saw so standing there going, what in the hell is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> and he walked through, and it, you know, everybody's like, what the fuck? That, 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 that dude, Prince. Without security. Yeah, he wasn't, at that time, he, I mean, nobody really, I mean, yeah, they knew him, but they didn't, He wasn't you know. big like that yet, yeah. Right, and, 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 and being in Minnesota, everybody don't react to Prince the same and way Trump as he went to like another that, state. Yeah. Sure. So yeah. Yeah. after that, I remember telling uh, the story, we were in Brazil for the Rock and Rio, huh. and we were in the band at that point, and... We were on the bus talking about who the first, when was the first time you ever saw Prince? This was a question that was asked of everybody in the band. We was all in there with Miko, Levi, me, Mike, uh, 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 Rosie, and, and, you know, and Matt Fink was playing keyboard at that time because that was the new tour. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And we were talking about the times, Devin, and I, and I started speaking on that that particular time seeing him. And, yeah. you know, when we when he came into the school, everybody, you know, everybody on the basketball team, man, that motherfucker looking like a little faggot. I hate it. Like, what the hell is that shit? And so I'm telling the story, and Prince oh, walks across as I'm in the middle of it, right? Yeah. And everybody, he, uh, so what are you guys doing? Everybody turned around. He's like, oh, we were just talking about the first time we ever met you. Um, okay, so who's talking? Dana. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> And I'm mm-hmm. telling that story, and he's like looking at me, and I, and you know I'm telling him like, well, you know, he walked in, man, and he had on that speedo stuff and the old dirty mind stuff, man. Everybody thought you was kind of gay or you know tagging or stuff. And he's like, um, what do you think that now? Uh, oh. but, but no, nah, bro. I mean, you ain't no fag. I mean, I don't think so. I think you're a pimp. And he went, uh, why do you think I'm a pimp? <laughs> I'm like, all these women that you have around you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how he found out that you know how i met him or how i yeah. first saw him and stuff yeah. and then yeah. i think the first time we had conversation with him was um during purple rain uh when they asked us you know when we first got the, the cassette to go practice on the song and we went back to this dressing room where him and the time was that was the first time actually hearing like speaking to him yeah uh, he, he's like okay so let's see what you got and we threw together the routine and we walked out of the room. And then next thing we know, the manager, Alan Lead, who was his yep. manager at the time, came to me and goes, hey, uh, kid, want you guys to uh, be featured. So we're going to put you guys in this section, blah, blah, blah. We're like, oh, yeah. cool. You know, and that's how we first met him. Now, after that, I think the next time we talked to him was we're getting ready to go to Hollywood and do the premiere. Mm-hmm. And he gives us a song and we went out there and he's telling us what the what the concept was supposed to be and all that. And that was when we first had to talk to him. So cool. I have a question. It actually it intersects with Alan Leeds because when you first saw James Brown, he was the tour manager for James Brown oh, at that time. Okay. I do yeah. believe. Well, I, I had read something about that. Yeah. yeah. Now, did you know that during the nude tour? Cause I, you know, there's that early incarnation. No, you didn't, didn't have a clue that he was, Man, okay. no, no, I, I yeah. just noticed white cat came up to us in purple rain and was yeah, like, Yeah, you want the yeah. guys dancing in the bathroom? I was like, Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> like a little timid because we were in the bathroom when the brother saw us, yeah, yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, we were, a little we weird to be asked that kind we, of question. It was a downtime, you know, and we were, you know, supposedly yeah. supposed to be picking people to be on set, is what we right. were hired for. Yeah. Do this agency. Well, we were a little pissed off because we were like, damn, we're trying to be in the movie. And so we were in the bathroom on a downtime and, you know, and they're just stopping, feeding, clapping, just getting some groove on. And he walks in with Chick. Mm-hmm. Chick's standing right behind him. He walks in, stop. And he just looked and he stood there while we were still. So we didn't stop mm-hmm. what we were doing. We yeah. just kept dancing. Mm-hmm. And he looked. And then he walked back out. Uh-huh. And then I'm being curious because I saw him and I'm like, oh, shit, you know, we might be in trouble and shit because we were supposed to be, you know, taking right. a break. But we were pretty loud in the bathroom. Walk out there and I see him. I look over the rail and he's pointing up and he's talking to Alan Lee. And yeah. I'm like, oh, shit. And so I kind of lean back off the rail. And then I see dude coming up the stairs and he's like, hey, were you one of the guys dancing in the bathroom? I'm like, uh, yeah. He said, well, the kid wants to know if you guys to do something. I said, the kid? He said, Prince, you know who the movie's about. I said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, he said you would know who the other guys were. I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, wow, I'm going to go get a cassette. You find the guys and then, uh, I'll meet you out here and I'll get you guys a cassette. I was like, cool. So I go to the bathroom and, you know, we're all displurred and now we're getting ready to go back out because yeah. they, they're getting ready to start back up filming. Yeah. And I stopped Tony. I go, hey, man. So, yo, so this dude just came up to me, man, and, you know, was telling me that, he, you know, they might want to have us do something. And he goes, yeah, right, nigga. You, you got to be kidding me, right? And don't be playing game, man. I got to go. I'm going to go down here and get in this set. I was like, yo, no, dude, I'm for real. 
And he said, yeah, yeah, when it comes, let me know. And he left. And I was like, nigga, you don't want to believe me? <laughs> <laughs> so he goes and gets on the scene. Uh-huh. And Alan comes up and he goes, hey, so here's the tape. He said, so you get the guys and you guys be back here tomorrow morning and have the routine ready. And, you know, so, yeah. you know, I tell Tony, and, you know, now here's Tony standing. And he's like, oh, oh damn, are you for real? I was like, yeah, I told you, dude, I'm not playing. And so we get the cassette. We get we pull Kurt, we pull Everett, we pull Scott and and and, and them guys. And Scott winded up, you know, being the other guy, the fifth guy. It was five of us. Okay. So we're like, okay, so we go over to Tony's house, over to his mother's apartment, a little two bedroom apartment. And uh we put together the routine in his mama's living room <laughs> in an apartment building. Wow. And we put that routine together. I think it was made up in May have been 12, 1 o'clock in the morning uh, when we displayed it from the from Purple Rain with the, the filming and we had went home and we put together the routine for seven songs between seven. 1 and 4 in the morning. Wow. And seven we songs. wind up going back the next morning, 5.30, whatever time they starting to shoot. And uh, that's how we got the opportunity. I got to ask a follow-up question to that. Ain't nobody pounding on the apartment floor. Turn that shit down. <laughs> at, at one in the morning, his mama was like, what the hell are y'all doing? <laughs> Man, of course. But were neighbors but, you know, complaining I mean, about the noise of the sound or nothing like that? Hey, I'm sure the downstairs neighbors probably heard a bunch of foot stomping and whatever. But, you say. know, hey, it was an apartment building. And what were we going to do? Pass up this opportunity? I don't no, think no, no. So. Of course not. But yeah, okay. Hey, oh, and somehow, a funny thing. You, yeah, we're doing the doing the. We were practicing in the tape breaks. Oh shit! The very I heard you talk about that. Tape, yeah. It snapped. Now you know. Back in the Gotta day, get the I pencil. That. Get that pencil to wind that shit back up. I'd listen. Uh, we all grew up with cassettes. Screw that joker. Put some tape on it and blink and call it in a day and yep. get that joker rolling. So we. Yep. Right, right. <laughs> listen, my Damn parents it. had an old Blaupunkt cassette. Man, that thing chewed up more things than Pac Man chewed up dots. Let me tell you something. Like for real. Damon, we know, we all know how talented Prince was and, you know, the stories are, you know, have been told ad infinitum. Can you talk about what the relationships were like for the band? You know, when, when yeah. you know, you know it, even, you know, going into the new power generation, the creativity and because Prince was great, obviously, but his supporting cast was legendary obviously yeah. and, and and any good performer i think has a good supporting cast can you talk about what the dynamic and the relationships were like oh man um you know first and foremost prince didn't really need nobody to do the stuff that he did okay yeah. so that in itself is a testament to how talented he is and how incredibly uh creative he was about stuff um being in that band and being you know um with the, with the everybody, all the different personalities and stuff, I always say that, you know, Prince picked people to fit what he was trying to do at a certain time. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody that came into that, you know, he would, and it was like he picked time to talk to you about who you were, what you're doing, you know, and I believe, I mean, for me, it's like, and, and this is just my opinion, the other people may feel something different, but I think he, he paid attention to everybody. He paid attention to how you, your demeanor, how you were, uh, whether you playing an instrument, whether you're dancing. He watched everything and he knew everything that you were doing and what you were supposed to do. Mm. Okay. I, I, I never, I mean, it was so many different personalities and so many different, you know, egos about how it was, but there wasn't, once everybody was together, it was, and I say this back then, and I did an interview back then that said, it was like everybody was family, and you had this big brother who was, you know, cultivating you, teaching you, showing you, yeah. you know, this is what you're supposed to be, this is what you're, you know, this was supposed to happen at this time. He would leave Levi in charge of, of creating, the, you know, getting the music so everybody knows what they were supposed to do. So if he comes in, we would already kind of know what we're supposed to be doing. Um, us for dancers, um, we would ask for a tape. 
because yeah. we couldn't sit there and, and keep waiting on him to go over the song again and go over the. We wanted to be ready for the next song, so we'd ask for a tape of the the set so we know what was coming up and what needed yeah. to be done. Because dance wise, we wanted to be creative. We wanted to be able to bring his what he was talking about to life on stage. And you can't do that when you're just going over stuff. But the chemistry between everybody was incredible. Yeah. It was like, I mean, it was different from anything I've ever been in. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I've seen a lot of bands that just, you know, they they put bands together and you got certain guys that's better at this and certain guys at that. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't that. I mean, Prince was the... He was the standard. He was what you was trying to get at. You want to be something, you need to yeah. follow his lead. He was like a chef. To me, he's yeah. like a chef. And we're all these people in here chopping up all these, you know, chopping up the onions, chopping up the greens, and then making sure everything fit in this yeah. pot. We used to always talk about being in the studio and saying, it's like, you know, going in there and put that kitchen grease on and we're going to, you know, cook up something. Mm -hmm. And everybody had a, you know, everybody was pretty, pretty much just enjoyed being around each other. We laughed a lot. Prince didn't, I mean, he was stern. It's there were some days you you'd wonder which Prince he was gonna get when he mm -hmm. walked in the door. Mm -hmm. Some days, you know, you just didn't know who you was gonna get. You might get that joking guy that might be laughing about some stuff or crack a joke on you. And then you had that professional dude that just when he walked in, it was like, where where are we at now? what we're doing and you had to be ready and he knew yeah. everybody's he knew he, he knew the sound guy's position the light guy's position he knew the technician that was That's sitting true. down in there that was supposed to be checking mm -hmm. on the monitor checking on the keyboard checking on the drum he knew what they were supposed to be doing he watched everybody dance wise yeah. i i was amazed that he would see stuff that we're doing and he would pay attention enough that he knew and he wanted to jump in where he wanted to jump in. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't see him as a dancer, but he loved to dance. So it, and, it, and it just kind of shocked me that when we were doing stuff, he'd go, uh, what would you guys doing right here? And then we'd show him and he'd go, oh, yeah. And then he'd jump in and we're like, hey, when did you? But remembering he recorded everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I'm going to go home and watch these guys. I mean, Gene Simmons, when Prince passed, called him a singularity. When I hear all the things that you're talking about, it's not, and not just because he wrote, recorded, engineered, math, you know, did a lot, all these different roles musically, but then you think about the whole big picture and how yeah. he was able to compartmentalize his brain to, new, to know where everybody was supposed to be at. And the way you're talking about just the sound people, the lighting people, you know, and of course the great Roy Bennett. Oh let's, man, let's, let's shout him out. He for a loved hot Roy too, man. He loved Roy too. Well, I mean, Roy's still at it. I mean, he just did recently uh, uh, Paul McCartney's shit for the Get Got Back tour. All the visuals for that was tremendous. So Roy Body did. Roy, Roy got busy and couldn't do one of our tours, or like something came up that he couldn't do yeah. the tour. And Prince was like, "Well, why can't he?" And it was like, "Well, they were trying to explain to him, like, well, he's got a gig with someone." And he's like. Well, can you call him? Can you can you guys get him here? And there was some guy we were using over there, and Prince did not like him. And mm -hmm. Prince was like, uh, so I don't want him. And we're sitting there like, oh, what you gonna do for lighting? He's like, hell, I'll run it from the stage. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, bro. So you gonna tell him what to do? <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, this man like everything. You know what I mean? He knew what he wanted. Yep. You know what I mean? So and had the resources I, to get it at that time too. You know, so well, he wants. Of course, yeah, right. yeah. Of course, he had the resources. I mean, he. Yeah. I, I remember him firing a sound guy that that was jacking up on the road. Mm. Get rid of him! I don't like him. Like, well, who's gonna run the sound? Yep. And he's like, I'll just go out here, and he's out in the audience, up by the board, listening to the guitar, fixing that. And I'm sitting there going, okay, so this dude is like, Next you know, time. and you knew not to say nothing. You ain't going to say like, well, man, what the hell are you doing? He, mm -mm. he knew what he wanted. <laughs> I mean, how many artists know exactly, I mean, just have their hand on everything. 
MJ yeah. comes to Michael Jackson comes to mind. That's you know guys like that. I don't even I don't even know if Mike had, yeah. had that. But anybody that's going to even come close to that orbit, you know what I mean? Because you watch yeah. like, even watching the This Is It documentary that you know the the the, the last tour that he was supposedly going to do before he passed, and you could see he knew he paid attention to every detail, or at least they made it seem that way. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know you can't touch what. Yeah, I mean you were there, so you you can speak to you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't think Prince really ever had anything against Mike. I just think that he they, he he yeah. got tired of people trying to compare them. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's like he's like, Apples well, Mike's oranges. a performer. I'm a musician. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And yeah. and then, and in that sense, yes, it is. I I don't. I mean, I don't know a lot about Mike, but everything I've ever seen, I've never seen him sitting in no studio playing an instrument. He would hum and, and he would hum and sing. Stage, yeah, he would sing his piano. Parts. I didn't see yeah, him playing really. a guitar on the stage. I didn't mm -hmm. see him do. I'd seen him perform. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Chris was doing all of that. Yeah, Damon, how collaborative was it for the group when you were working together, input wise? And I'll give you a specific example. Um, the performance that you all did on the Arsenio Hall show for Diamonds and Pearls in 1991. I mean the 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 steps the the routines are intricate, but you made them look seamless. Was that a collaborative affair between you know you and Kirk and Tony and Prince? Would you you know would you um, bounce ideas off each other? We well, me Tony and Kirk, pretty much we basically did all the choreography. Prince just jumped in. He watched, like I said, he paid attention to everything we did. So when we showed him a routine. He would say, okay, I'm going to jump in on this fight. And then we show him that section and he'd do what he had to do. But we kept telling him because we, we put a, there's a lot of energy that goes into what we were doing. And we were telling him, like, dude, you sure you want to do that part? And he's like, yeah. We're like, but you got to sing. And he's like, I got it. And we're like, fuck okay, it. All right. Whatever, man. You, you can, if you can hang, come on, let's do it. So we pretty much put all the choreography, all the, all the choreography together. And and he just jumped in where he fit in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where yeah. there was in the song that was giving him that opportunity to do stuff. Now, mm. we would do certain things. And I remember me, Tony, and Kurt would do this thing where I would do a handstand with my legs coming over Tony's shoulder. Tony would grab my legs and I would be kind of at an angle like that. And yeah. Kurt would hold on to my legs and we did this spin yes. mm -hmm. and him on. Shit. Prince says he wants to do it. So if yeah. you ever see the ride divine, mm -hmm. that move that we do with with Prince hanging on my legs and doing that, that was me, Tony, and Kirk. We did that on tour, but Prince wanted to do it for that. Okay, wow. it was wow. fine, but the thing was the weight balance kind of threw off because now wow. you know Kirk being a big dude, me being a big dude, and then Tony in the middle giving that balance. Well, we, now we got a buck oh five, <laughs> two hundred. <laughs> and the love dude, and then looking like a tear top, <laughs> like uh, and I like, please don't let him jump down, right? Because right. I'll be swinging back. <laughs> Com compared to that, you're talking about the whole time we're doing it. Yeah. I'm nervous as hell because I'm like, he better not jump off this shit. Yeah, and that's a... yeah, it didn't happen. He jumped off anyway, and Kirk Tony was trying to hold my leg while I'm, you know, now you don't see it while we're doing the show, but it was like it was funny. It was funny as hell. I was like. Man, I almost died. I, I was scared. No mishaps in practice or anything, too. That's a well. You know, you oh, knew no, what you were doing. No, no. no. Uh, if you, if you, yeah. if something happens on stage, you would never know it was wasn't meant to happen. Mm -hmm. right. You would never know just because that's how tight we were cohesively when we're doing stuff. I mean, it was you know. I mean, hell, my first tour, I almost slipped off the stage on the new tour. Yeah. Uh, first show, it was oh, raining. Shit. Man, the man did not want to cancel the show, and it was pouring rain over in uh Holland, Rotterdam. I ain't gonna never oh, forget yeah. it. Slide down that ramp was almost under the crowd, Jack. <laughs> he loved he loved him some Rotterdam. I mean, we think about the oh, days yeah. before you got in there with Sign of the Times and all that stuff, which yeah, you man. almost were a part of then too. So there's a little yeah. missing piece, I think, in this whole conversation. He got he took you guys seriously when you had a band of your own. 
right? You yes. all went out there with some musicians and you had a bit. What was the name? MPLS? Was that? MPLS, yes. And no relation. Players Lang Sound. That was the name of the group, right. but we abbreviated to MPLS. So. so would you mind talking a little bit about that setup? Because you were probably playing. Did you ever play bunkers? I knew you played like different clubs around no, the area. We, you know what? We we When we put that, that group together, we yeah. were playing like the college circuit. Okay. We we went out and played like the little local, you know, community college circuit where people were hiring bands to come play. Um, we played. We did the Fine Line. Oh, cool. um, okay. We did a show in Chicago. They had us had us come out to Chicago. We did wow. a show for like Oprah Winfrey, Cheryl Pepsi Riley, and them guys. We did a show. Oh some shit! Things for they, when they were all there, huh. and then we did the uh, First Avenue for KMOJ. Yeah, I remember, I remember you talking about. That's the I didn't one know about the came. Oprah one. I didn't know about Chicago and the Oprah one. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people don't know it. I mean, I got I got it on videotape, but we did Shh. that show. And I'd love to see that shit. We were trying to get our band started. We were trying to get out. Come, you know, that was that 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 is still a time where um, we weren't sure Prince wasn't trying to do stuff with us. He had yeah. us come and do little dance stuff here and there, and then uh, we wasn't getting any. You know, so we were trying to make a name for ourselves. <sighs> But we sit back after the first time, after the Purple Rain tour, and they didn't ask us to come out. Then they did Love Sexy. Right. No, I take that back. But then they had Sheila and them come, and Sheila and them was doing some stuff. And then they, you know, we thought we were going to go with them. And then they did Sign of Time. And we were like, and we look up, and Jerome, Wally, and Brooks, the three dancers. Yeah. And yeah. we are like, what? Yeah. yeah. We've been waiting all that time. And so then we started putting together the little band stuff. And, um, I, I believe he heard about it, but then we did Camel J's birthday or uh, Christmas party and he shows up yeah. and we're like, you know, at that time he's, you know, it's like 89, getting ready to be 90. And, you mm -hmm. know, he's like, I think it was 89 or, or 87. And he's, you know, kind of checking us out. 89, we did that thing for him and, and he came down and he came down with a, uh, Robin Powers. <laughs> and we're we're doing the show. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, I and I have this on tape too. So we, oh, we're doing sure. this show and we're doing this thing coming down, you know, doing our little sorority thing, coming to the stage. And we get up on stage and we start doing our little thing. Couple songs in, maybe two or three songs in, we see him standing on the side of the stage talking about. And we're like, <laughs> like you performing? What you mean? Come here! <laughs> so he sends Robin up on the stage to try to throw us off, which is what I thought it was. Because why else would you send some woman up on our stage while we're in the middle of doing our show? Right. So she comes up and she's up there, and we playing this beat, and she's doing what she's known for. Mm -hmm. And we're like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. All right. <laughs> And then we get done and he's like, hey, I need you guys to come out to Paisley. I'm like, uh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. That was the part where we started, you know, we were going out there and he was rehearsing. He wasn't telling us anything. We were just out there because he asked us to come out there. Right. We're sitting. Nothing happened the first night. We had rehearsal for our MPLS band because we had another show coming up. Sure. And Kirk comes back and goes, yeah, I think dude's going to have me be the DJ on his show. I'm like, who? And he said, Prince. I'm like, what? And so we're sitting there going, wait, he asked yeah. you to be the DJ? And we were just like kind of flabbergasted, like, what the fuck was that all about? You have us all come out there and you tell Kirk to be a DJ? Yeah. Kirk's no DJ. So we're like, well, uh, uh, okay. All right. Next night, we go back out there again. We're sitting there. Now, mind you, I got three jobs. I was working three jobs, and I'm going, dude, y'all taking away from my money. You know, I got, mm -hmm. I got, I got kids over here. I'm trying to, you know, in a, an apartment yeah. I got to be paying for. Yeah. So, Next night, Tony calls me. He goes, "Hey, man," he said, "Where were you at?" You, you know what I said, "Man, I ain't, I don't have time to be coming out there like that, dude. I gotta work." So, 
Tony goes, yeah, well, he's I signed, you know, I signed my contract. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, yeah. And then Craig Rice calls me. Uh huh. He goes, hey, where were you at the other night? I'm like, at work. He's like, well, can you make it out there today for the? I was like, uh, so what time is that gonna happen? Because I, I got to be at work, and when I get off of that one, I got my second job. And he like, well, if you come out there, I get, I get, you know, I can guarantee you it'll be worth your while. I'm like. Like the other two nights, dude, I said, I don't I have time to sit. So I go out there. Right. Craig called me in his office and he's like, yeah, so we signed the other two guys. And uh, so they, they said it was not going to be cool unless we get all three of you guys and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, OK. OK. And so I signed this contract and then I go back in the room and I'm like, so what time is this over with? And they're like, what? I was like, I got a second job to be at. <laughs> I've already missed my first one. And right. Craig looked at me and goes, you, you do realize that you, your contract, you, you're, you're getting a salary. And I went, that's all. You know, I'm young. I'm in my 20s. I'm like, I don't know shit about no contract. I don't right. know what you're talking about. But I know right. that job ain't going to pay my bills. <laughs> I, mean, I got to get over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, wind up leaving. And then that night, uh, Craig called me again. He got, so you're going to be at rehearsal tomorrow, right? And I'm like, well, yeah. I said, how long does that be? I said, you do. You got to explain something to me here. You talk about salary. What does that mean to me? I don't. I don't really know. He says, oh, you haven't never been a, you know, you've never worked for a salary. I'm like, no, dude. I work week to week for my checks. <laughs> right. And he goes, well, basically, you got a salary now. You don't have to worry about working that job. And I'm like, uh, really? And he goes, yeah. So you'll get paid blase blase every week. Uh, if you go on the road, you're going to get a per diem and, and then the, your, your, the rate that you were working for rehearsals will be different from the one you go on the road. And I went, uh, okay, so I'll say that again. You're going to do what? <laughs> and, and what do I have to do? He said, you're, you're there, you're part of the band. So whatever he tells you, he wants you to do, you'll be, you know, I was like, huh, okay. And that's how that shit happened, man. And I, I was, I, I mean, I was very, I'm appreciative. Now I look back on it and I go, sure. I was just naive. I didn't really know. I don't know. You know, you want me to be in a band? What is, what does that consist of? Yeah. <laughs> like, and it was, it was amazing. And so, you know, for me, I, 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 I took, I don't take that for granted at all. No, the sure opportunity. Not. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Well, and you know, you were part of a very important chapter in his, a musical life and we look at the landscape of music i mean hip-hop is ruling the roost right yeah and yeah. how did you i don't know how to quite ask this but how did you feel his incorporation of hip-hop went in the in the in the early new power generation you're like this is whack this is oh this is cool oh he's oh. trying a different seasoning in the ingredient yeah i i, I put it this way because you know me and tony was we're very, very, very close. I mean, yeah. we, we, before we got in the band and through all the years, um, you know, Tony wrote a lot. He wrote yeah. a lot on the side, just those stuff that he would do um, when we were in our band. You know what I mean? Sure. So Tony was already doing a bunch of writing. And so the opportunity for the music, when we were, I remember us having a rehearsal, we had a sound check in one of these countries and, you know, they were playing Humpty Dance. Yeah, I love that. Song. And Tony, you know, in the, you know, Levi was over there hitting his chin, and they <laughs> heard Tony, you know, doing their, you know, he got on the mic and started hitting the Humpty Dance, and you know, he was like, oh, and I think that caught Prince's eye. I was like, oh, okay, so he can rap a little bit. Yeah. So for me, I think you know it was just him wanting to test the water. Now. There was story. Somebody said the Black Album Prince roasted rappers. He didn't like rappers and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think that was true because no. I remember him talking about Tupac, how he thought he was a great writer. Yeah. How he, you know, he liked Tupac. Um, and then later, as time moved on, all these other rappers, he gave Tony the opportunity of a lifetime. And Tony yeah. grabbed a hold of that shit and ran. Yes, he did. And you know, and yeah. and rightfully so. I mean, you know, 
we were hearing all the story. People were, oh man, Princeton doing rapping. And he got that dude doing this. That. All I could say, you know, for me at that time and, and, and when all that was going on, I was like, this is my boy. I know he can write. Yeah. I'm like, uh, you know, you can say what you want to. Every rapper has, you know, yes. have to come along somehow. And, and a Somebody different gave style. An opportunity. <laughs> and hip hop was, was, was kind of new back then. It was like, you sure. know, when you talk about hip hop starting in, you know, the 79, 80 era, yeah. when all them guys were, you know, all these rappers were coming out and people were going, who is that? And what's that? What, what kind yeah. of music is this? Um, you know, it wasn't like it was new to Prince at all no. he knew about all these rappers he knew about all these all this, this stuff hey. he didn't have nothing against rappers irresistible got, he, bitch he got... is a rap irresistible bitch the the b-side right. is a rap he was already doing that shit damon i always tell people why are you missing the boat out on that that was a rap <laughs> okay tell me this what did morris day do did morris day sing or did he just talk isn't I that mean, a form of rapping? Yeah, but wait, but Jerk Out, before they recorded it in, for the Pandemonium album, and you were involved in that graffiti bridge period, Prince had already had that in the can nine, ten years prior to that. Okay, so he already knew how to use the format if he wanted to yeah. use it. Yeah. If he wanted to use it. Yeah, if he wanted to use it. And then to have somebody like Tony, who was, you know, for creative writing, he gave him that opportunity to bring that to his stage. I always liked his. Uh, and let me call if I shout it to your boy. To, to, I always like people. Are like, oh, he doesn't rap like anybody else. But that's that's where Prince is genius comes into play. And thank you. Tony thank didn't you. rap like everybody else. Like everybody he else. He was no. his own thing. Yeah. Breaking ground. Yes. Breaking. Yes. He was. Prince was like, OK, oh, this yep. is going to be the Minneapolis style. This is going to be the North Side style. This is how we do it in the North Side. We don't exactly. do it like they do it in exactly. Brooklyn. We're not doing it like they're doing it in L.A. Thank you. We're doing it we, like if Minnesota. If you go back and look at any of the stuff we did on the on the uh, Gold Nigga album, <laughs> oh, check that stuff out. All that, oh, shit, yeah. all, all them songs and, and what we were doing in that, that was strictly North Side shit. Yeah, yeah. It's a you know what I mean? Flavor. I mean, yeah. it's just how we how we got on. You, you listen to, you know. The, the the rap he did, well, Prince didn't want to be a part of the rap. I'll put it this way. That video, he's like, nah, y'all go ahead. We're going to let y'all do the video over there. And we're going to flash back to the studio and I'll do my part. You know? And, yeah. and it's too funny because we talk about frying up chicken and selling it at the party. That's what yeah. we did back in the day. <laughs> sure did. But I always feel I always feel Prince is a black artist and this gets often missed. By, by people who are or casual fans is that he wasn't culturally appropriating anything. It was part of the culture that he was a part of as well. He was already, yeah. like I yeah. said, irresistible bitch. He already did the rap part. He didn't yeah. do it all the yeah. time, but when he did it, <laughs> it was, yeah. Impact. yeah. I mean, people call me rude. I wish we all were nude. Dude, that part in controversy. I wish there was no black and white. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, that's, <laughs> too. It's just like he just didn't, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody I had mean, their own opinion about how you sure know, the, did. the whole rap thing and how it came about that Tony got a part of. But you're not missing yeah. the, you know, like you said, you're missing the point that Prince did it to the beat of his drum. That, okay. It, it wasn't part. about what everybody else thought and what mm. y'all, you know, y'all been. This is what I, I see right now. Right. At that time, that's what was hidden for him. And he dug the shit out of Tony. But you all were using samplers and stuff like that. I mean, he was incorporating that. But what he was doing that the other groups weren't doing. You know, I was like, yeah. he would talk in later interviews about my microphone is on. Right? right. He was having everybody use these samplers in real time. So poor Tommy Barbarella. Jesus Christ. He's already playing nine fucking parts. Oh, of diamonds and pearls. Tommy, then Tommy, he's got to yeah. trigger these fucking samples for the next song. I mean, always yeah. pushing the envelope of technology, right? Always oh. pushing, you know, your choreography was pushing the, and then, you know, you had to, as a, as a dancer, you had to rely on them to play the sample where you were doing the dance move at a certain point too, because I'm sure you oh, had yeah. to listen yeah. to all this shit. People don't realize that he was doing this shit in real time with the samples. There was no oh, backing man. track, right? Listen, to everything that, yeah. everything that was done on that stage and and even in rehearsals, yeah. it was like it was 
it was clockwork, man. It's like, you know, there was so much information that you had to take in. Right. Um, the musicians, I, I tell you, man, and I and I say this a lot of times when I post up and I talk about the band, I said, man, I'm some of the most talented, incredibly talented dudes. Yeah. You had to be if you sitting in Prince's band. Right. You better be on top of your game. Cause if you weren't on top of your game, you'd be out. And that's including dance stuff. That's yeah. including dance stuff. It's like, no, if you don't know what you're doing, I mean, I changed the route, changed a dance step one night in a show, yeah. and I remember him turning around singing something twice. Yeah. And he turned around to me. And then when we finished the show, he said, like, uh, did you hear me sing that twice? And I was like, yeah, I was wondering what you was doing. He said, uh, it's because you changed something and I uh, couldn't remember where I was. And, and I stopped for a second and I was like, wait, well, hold on, what? Yeah, so what do you normally do right here? And he pulls up the tape and he's showing me and I was like, right. oh yeah, I said, you know, I've been doing that for the last five shows, so I figured I'd switch it up a little bit. He's like, he said, don't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went, he's he's real like... You've got such a complicated production that he was relying on you. You know, people think he's so he, independent. You know, he does a little spin, right? And in that spin, I did something different. So he initially thought, and everybody else in the band was looking like, "Did he just sing that twice?" And we're all confused. Well, supposedly it was my fault. Okay. <laughs> I I changed the dance step, which threw him off to sing the line again. So now the band's playing that right. line again, going, "Well, okay, maybe we missed something." Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it brings so, back to I the got point for that night too. So let's yeah, just say that. Yeah. Keep it real, right? <laughs> but yeah, you, I got but, but it's back to your earlier point, though, man. Is that he knew where everybody was and where they had to be. That's how aware he was. There aren't many performers like him that do. James Brown didn't even was even that detail oriented. Let's keep that up. No, he wasn't. No, James James was just like do what I tell you to do when I hit this. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> But Prince knew where everybody was. Everybody was. That's incredible. Look, you have to have a. That's a genius right there. On honest to God, you, you can't. You yeah, can't. yeah. Sorry, Jay. I know I'm kind of. Yeah, no. It's a, so, Damon, let, let me just follow that up a little bit because Prince knew where everybody had to be and was that involved. And we've heard the stories, but from your perspective, what was rehearsal like? Was rehearsal as grueling and long oh. as we've heard? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jay, I'm going to tell you, man, uh, rehearsal started at one in the afternoon and they didn't end till seven or eight o'clock at night. Just and, you, and it was nonstop. We had, a, I mean, he give you a break. Let me, uh, let me clarify. We did get breaks, you know, you get a 15 minute here and there, just like a regular guy. Yeah, yeah. You got a 15 minute break. You got a lunch break. Go get your little food, come back and we're getting ready to get at it again. But they were all day, every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there'd be some of them days rehearsal would go through and he'd be like, feeling like he wants to do something. Well, he might say, hey, well, we're going to have a party tonight. Well, you literally, you know, you're going to come back to the party and you'd be playing. Yeah. We're actually going to test this out on some people now. Uh, okay. Like, oh, shit, what? Oh, and that was yeah. all the time. It was like yeah. you... You had to, you, that just goes to show you how much you had to be on point, how much you had to be like always thinking, At always knowing, knowing your part, all yeah. of that. Because if you didn't, and he like, hey, we're going, we, we throwing a party tonight, we're going to play. And it, and it wasn't always yeah. like you knew it like right then. Yeah. You get there and thinking you come in to hang out because that's what he wanted you to do. And you get there and you're like, oh, yeah, this party thing. Uh, then you get that that one bodyguard that that one that comes to bring you that news, like the Grim Reacher. Uh, Prince wants you guys back there. Like, what? Time back to there. go to work. <laughs> Time to go to work. <laughs> like I thought we were done for the night. Yeah, no, uh, -uh. no, Jay. no. It's time to work, nigga. Yeah. You finna get in, do your stuff, check this yeah. out. This is what we doing, and it's like, oh shit, <laughs> we really finna play? Yeah, you know, and then. The fact that some of the time we we went to a club one night in another country, dude, the stage wasn't big at all. But you want all of us up there, right? All what? of us, yeah. The two keyboard players, the good time bass player, the drummer, and then us behind him. Are you right. kidding me? That's no room. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you find yourself hitting them moves in them spots. <laughs> you was you was being you you being a mime with right. some look, flavor. Right, they hit that shit. Look, all them big moves <laughs> that, that, that stuff became right here. <laughs> they went out here no more. But you were a problem solver. So does that tie? Let me th- th- let's tie that into the. So the Diamonds of Pearls box set that came out not so long ago has that Glam Slam show. That's a great example of what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Can you talk yeah. so, to us about so the deets we on that one? So that it, in itself was one of them, hey, we're going to have a dress rehearsal. Okay. We're like, okay, thinking it's going to be at Paisley. And they like, no, we're right. going to do it down at Glam Slam. What? Now, mind you, they just they put that on the radio earlier that day. That shit sold out in less than an hour. Yeah. And they were like, oh, what? And yeah. we 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 basically that was a rehearsal show. Yeah. See what you got? See, see how much you can handle. That is a rehearsal show. Man. Damon, I mean, what, and the, yeah, I'm sorry, Jay. What was the frenzy like when you would travel? Let's say the prince wasn't even with you as a band. You know, I mean, what was it, the fan experiences and things like that? What was that dynamic like when you would just be out and about? Yeah, I, I'm, we, you know, when we flew out to some of the places we had flood, we'd get there and we might have a day off just to hang out and, you know, do whatever. Um, um, example, the first tour we went on, the new tour, when we got over to Holland, um, in Rotterdam, and then we we had the night off, so we were just kind of hanging out. We went yeah. walking to the red dis- red light district, and yeah. all these little coffee shops where they were selling weed and all this stuff. And I'm going, they sell weed right. at the coffee shop? Like what? Yeah, like damn you're kidding me, right? And we're going to the bars, and they had so we were just kind of hanging out. We would always, you know, find something to do. Um, mm, sure. And then once he got there, it was like you know, if we had to, you know, the next day would probably be a show we go to sound check from there but um you know our travel time was different from his you know like i think he would always get there before us or something or you know and just kind of chill in his room or whatever but we never stayed at the hotel he stayed at yeah um i think the rock and real thing we stayed at the same hotel he did but other than that we we never really stayed at the same hotel with him oh god we were at a different about- hotel yeah, sorry to interrupt you there, Damien. Can you talk to us about Rock and Rio? Because Jesus Christ, that that you know, because because that is Barbarella's first gig. And if I'm not mistaken, is that Michael? No, no, that's not his first gig because he did the Party Man video in Saturday Night Live, 15th anniversary. But, but that, that was, was Tommy Barbarella's first, first gig. That was his first right like, real gig, though, like like concert wise, I believe. Shh. Three hundred thousand people, and you also had like Guns and Roses and all these other. There was a whole people. bunch of people there, man. There was a whole bunch of different groups there that we would. I mean, hell, Boosie them was there. What was that like for you? I mean, the first time to Rio, oh, I imagine. Man. That to, to to come out on of a stage that that was huge as that was, dude. I honestly, I think the stage was itself was probably a block long, <laughs> and then. That ain't including the dang two big ass screens they had on each end of, yeah. <laughs> of the platform, and you're just looking out in this sea of people. And I mean, yeah. as far as you could see, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it was incredible, man. And I, I got a chance. I, I think at the hotel I met Boosie, you know, oh. the first time. That was the first time ever seeing him in person. And then he had on the star glasses and the whole nine, and he's like, Boosie Cullen, dude. Are you serious yeah. right now? Yeah. Is, yeah. You know, I mean, and then there was some other groups. The the, the boy bands back in the day was there. You know, what I mean? oh, yeah. and I was like, yeah, that's right, that's right. Everybody was all excited to see them. But when Prince, they said Prince, yeah, it was like it was crazy, man. It was one of the best experiences, you know, because it was that show that we did was raw, real yeah. raw stuff. And I mean, back then he had us in like dress suits. <laughs> sweating your asses off dance in a suit jesus <laughs> it's like if the time like, had to do acrobatics right you know because you was doing the zoot suit kind of style for for that, that we weren't just, in no zoot suit either oh, no, not zoot suit. Suit. Not, about yeah, suits yeah. That, you know you're trying to do a split and like uh-uh, you gonna oh really clothes. shit <laughs> give me some parachute pants now. to work with 
Could give uh-huh. you some parachute pants to work with, man. Something with a little room nah. down there. You know what I mean? <laughs> look, if, if you ever get a chance to see any footage from the new tour, look at the clothes we were wearing. <laughs> look at the clothes we were wearing. We were like, uh, I'm, I had on a damn suit jacket with some tight ass pants thing that I, there's no splits going on in these, bro. <laughs> uh, how how much uh, wardrobe, uh, did, you have any, did you have any wardrobe malfunctions of your own, you know, split, split down your, uh, any of that shit? Look, that's the reason we wore biker shorts underneath our clothes. Got if it. you have okay. a wardrobe malfunction, okay. they still don't see nothing. <laughs> How much of a nightmare was it for the seamstress to have to t- help maintain and take care of your uniform? Oh, my God. Like that, though, man. We changed quite a bit. I, uh, sure, for us, yeah. yeah, they were always in our dressing room having to bring some, you know, your, your next thing. Yeah, yeah. And if we, you know, I mean, just think, a suit jacket, a regular suit jacket. Once you started sweating, that joker was pulling with you. So Shh. this here was getting ripped all the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> Come off stage and be like, oh, yeah, this, this is what happens when you're dancing as high as we do. You're going to have a sleeveless vest by the time the show's oh, over. Y'all, I hope y'all got some somebody over there sewing this up because tomorrow <laughs> night is happening again. The show must go on, right? The show sure, must go on. Sure did. Yeah. And, you know, and we, were, we weren't no little guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I'm, what are you, I'm six, six four and a half. Six three and a half. Six three and a half, six four. I mean, I'm shrinking. I, I was six four when I started, but I'm I'm shrinking now. I'm getting old. That's right. Good gravity gets us all in the end, man. That's all right. <laughs> Look, Damon, is there is there one show out of the hundreds of shows that you've done that has a special place in your heart? Uh, I'm a. I, if I'm thinking one show that actually was the shit for me was um, the Arsenio Hall show was like the number one. Yeah. Second would be the Ride Divine. Mm-hmm. Wow. The Ride Divine was pretty cool because we shot that at Paisley. And we just kind of, you know, it was fun. I mean, I was I was put in a group called the Crayons. <laughs> I still have it on VHS. I, I recorded it when it came on. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I was part of the crayons, you know. <laughs> so that them two shows in itself. Now, if I'm talking about a on tour, um, you know, any show that actually was greater than one, I'll say Cork, Ireland, I... when he did Bambi. Yep. But that was the first time I'd heard him do it live. Right. And I was, we had just finished our little section of songs and we were going off stage and I was in the dressing room putting on clothes and he, boom, boom, boom. boom, boom. That's like, a great, that's such a great song. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Ran back to the side of the stage and I'm peeking around the corner going, like, he's playing Bambi. Are you serious right now? And I was just like, that was the Man. first time I was like, I was, let's just say I was fan struck at that point. Yep, yep. And but you I know, never heard him play it live. Yeah. So was that the only time in the nude tour that he played that? Did he play it at any other point? Or was that just a one off? You know I don't remember him playing it again. I just yeah. that night uh, he felt the mood to play that Joker and he he wore you, that Joker out. Yeah, he Let actually me played ask it, you the, Oh, sorry, Jack. Played it, so yeah, he played it in Japan. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, right. I thought I thought there was one other time. Yeah, but those are the only times Nagoya? I was could, it Nagoya? Oh, I think Nagoya. Uh, uh, Yokohama, I think, right? Yokohama, thank you, Jay. Yeah. That's Yokohama, it. yeah. But I wanted to ask you about Cork. Did you guys just spend any time in Cork? I was just there last year. I took my mom for her 80th. Cork is a cool little man. You ever have a chance in your life to go back? That is a cool little town. Yeah, um, well, shoot, when they got all the kids drinking at 15. <laughs> well, you know, it's actually it's actually not as bad as you think. It's a university town. It is a university. When I we, we were there, it, it, well, now this was summer. Let me be, ain't let me no 15-year-old drinking over here. Well, if no, they are, they're doing it illegal. Right. Well, listen, they're right. doing a lot more than drinking anymore, man. Shit. Let's like let's go. You ever watch Euphoria? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, shit. We'd be lucky if the only thing they was doing was drinking at 15. <laughs> we pulled up when we when we got off the plane and we're going like ride to the venue, and all these yeah. kids on the corners with their beer. And I'm going, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that they are Irish. They are Irish. That's that's what they do. 
Uh, oh, but we God, were there in the summertime, um, so the university was not in session. So uh, to, to, to be fair, we were there when it was a little chill time. Oh, uh, okay. But, but okay. it's a beautiful man. There's some place I could tell you to go for some. If you're a seafood man, let me tell you, there's some. They because you're by the water there, man. They yeah. they are no joke when it comes to fish, fresh fish out there, man. It, a beautiful yeah. country, beautiful yeah. country. And if yeah. I recall, because you you did intersect paths with Hockey Austin. Yeah. yeah, if I'm not mistaken, that was probably one of the last times he was on the nude tour. Was his last, uh, rock, well, maybe Rocket Rio, Rio might have been his last ride with Prince. I think that's what he yeah. told me. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we that the whole nude tour was was so funny because we was <laughs> we was playing ball and I mean we played basketball. We did all kind of stuff all you know when we weren't rehearsing or doing anything and we had some downtime. You know, Prince called himself want to always play us and stuff and you let them tell it they always beat us <laughs> there's two sides right. to every story <laughs> hey, look there's three sides to your story their side the side that we can tell you in the truth okay the truth, right? there you go and the truth was <laughs> we used to wear that tail out but they won't tell everybody that we just lost all the time that's fine that's all right <laughs> Damon, you got to work with some really, really talented people, obviously, you know, being in the new power generation. And you had mentioned, you know, walking into a room and the time was there. Can you talk about it being a part of it yourself also, but what that creativity and being in that orbit was like? Yeah, well, the time was, you know, um, and, and it's funny because when you when you look at Purple Rain, um, you know, Terry and Jimmy weren't there. Right. Yep. So the brother that was playing bass at the time, Jerry Hubbard, went to school mm -hmm. with us. Yeah. And nobody knew that. Everybody was like, you know, they think, you know, they thought, you know, uh, uh, Andre or whoever else was took his spot. I said, no, that was that was Terry, that was Jerry Hubbard. And yeah. it's like, you know, so there was a bunch of talented people yeah. uh, that came across that. And and when Terry and Jimmy, you know went on you know everybody know the story i'm not gonna yeah, get into yeah, it but, to, yeah you know yeah. they went on to do what they did and 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 jerry got that opportunity it was an opportunity of a lifetime for him to be a part of the time you yeah. know what i mean now moving forward i don't know how longer he stayed you know what i mean but um much all of them guys were just like incredible i mean you know i knew being from the neighborhood sure you know what yeah. i mean be before all of that and I didn't know but at the time I didn't know he was a drummer I didn't know he played in in the time none of that stuff I knew Jerome because we was in high school together mm -hmm. you know so there was a lot of talent man and 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 if I'm looking at the time itself you know I think Terry and Jimmy you know kind of kind of was like the foundation of it you know and and Morris was just someone that Prince was collaborating and making like, well, I think you should be this or that. Um, and I've heard the stories, you know, Morris was a drummer and then he got moved to the front, you know, to, yeah. to be the lead person and whatever. Yeah. But that was that creative thing coming from Prince. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, you'd be cool if you was out front. You know what I mean? He's like, well, I'm not a singer. Like, just be cool. <laughs> just be cool. And that works. Mm -hmm. You know well, what he I mean? would sing in an enterprise band of pleasure because I know Jimmy talks about this in several interviews. He would sing uh, behind the drum kit, come out and sing "Too Hot" by Cool and the Gang. I mean, he, oh. he, and, and, and and during breaks when the other singers, you know, were yeah. So they knew he could sing. You know, I mean, singing drummers, you know, come on, you know, and he was, uh, he was more, you know, again. Young, I, Morris don't sing. Not re yeah, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. No, I know what you're saying. I know. I mean, saying. Jay, you could probably do all his vocals and do that stuff too. <laughs> I should give it a try. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just go. Everybody walked by it. Anybody can do that. Come on now. Come on now. Let's be for real. Oh man. All right. Reverend is in the house. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Look here. <yeah. laughs> I can look, we, you know, we all, everybody, I mean, as many people that was a part of all of that stuff and all the talent that went through that thing, man, it's just, it, for me, I mean, I, I, I praise all them guys. I, cause they're, you know, they're 
musicianship and and creativity I just unmatched yeah. with all of them guys. I mean, you name it, man. All all the guys that have, that I've worked around and I've got a chance to just sit in and see, you know, and listen to the jam sessions and yeah. the jam sessions were were probably the highlight of any time you walk in a room and they're they're just jamming. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what's going on in here right now? You know, and it's just you sit there and you're just listening to all this, you know, ship it and I'm and I'm pretty sure that somewhere there was a recording going on every time we walked in a room. Yeah. But there's some stuff that probably just was meant for the sound stage when we were just coming in and rehearsing, they just jamming. I'm sure there's some shit somewhere that nobody's let nobody's heard yet. Mm-hmm. And you just and crazy, I, we just funking. Mm-hmm. So to piggyback off that. When the Diamonds and Pearls box set came out, and there's a whole lot of tracks. There might have been songs that you may have worked out choreographic routines to that we don't even know about. Do you, I'm sure you've looked at the, or, or listened to any of the stuff that I, came I've, out. I've any looked that at stuff? a little bit of it. I haven't, I haven't sit down and I okay. just like, oh, let me just. Because like out. he didn't have you all work on work that fat or any of that shit. You know, there's there's a song on the track that almost sounds like something off the Black album, and uh-huh. it sounded like. It, he, it sounded to me when you listen to the Diamonds and Pearls box set, it sounded like he was working out how guys like uh, uh, Teddy Riley was doing their stuff with the new Jack sound. It, it might have been. I mean, I, I, I haven't listened to I haven't listened to some of the stuff. I mean, but we were always. I mean, whatever they played, like even if they were jamming, yeah. and something came on that had a beat that that moved you, we just be get up and start doing stuff. Sure. Now, you know, he might say. Uh, what was that you guys were doing on this? And we're like, oh, and we'd show them again. You know, but when it came to what we were doing on stage, if he did a jam, like say we went to an after party mm. and he, we're at a club and he's like, oh, we're going to play tonight. I'm like, oh, shit. So now we're on stage and we're just freelance doing anything, whatever yeah. comes up. Yeah. There's a video floating around and I, I just saw a smidgen of it. We, I don't know where the hell we were. It looked like we were sweating like Hebrew slaves. <laughs> the lights were beaming, and, and we were just dancing. I had on a freaking tank top. Okay. A wife beater. Okay. And I was like, I'm like, where is this at? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm half dressed. What? <laughs> and, trying and to remember where the show was, and I, I, you know, and I, and I know. He, he did the, we did the whole show we were doing yeah. and I he left the stage and let us do some of the MPG stuff mm-hmm. and it was it was crazy man Tony started doing the rap and we were just you know walking it was almost like a concert but it was just a jam session but a song could have been born out of that at any time at I mean, any I time think a sexy MF you know something yeah. that was it Levi would say he would go into girls' dress rooms and go you sexy motherfucker yeah and Prince was yeah. like what was that and I'm not gonna do it as good as you do but you know what was that well we're gonna turn that shit into a song I yeah. mean a you lot know of he could take like anything that. yep the guys that's how the guy's mind worked oh I like that little bit I'm gonna turn that shit into a song oh of course I mean yeah. and there were times we, you know we were we were always going back and forth we used to have what we call the, the, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys ever had cat fights, uh, you know, play the dozens. dozens. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there were, there were some times those were being done. And, you know, I mean, some of that came across on the Golden Egg album, you know. <laughs> um, yes, yes. You know, Tony was, <laughs> was talking about the damn uh, uh, manager, the, uh, the people at the record company. And, and was, that was like, you know, what we would really be wanting to say to a motherfucker. <laughs> uh, and, wait, and he was one of them pranks, so he gonna get on the phone and call somebody and play a prank on him. And I'm like, dude, you really finna call him and do that? We in the studio. And I'm like, this dude is nuts. He, he did that to uh, something But he was for, just to like what we pearls, would do yeah. if we were out there. We were the same way. Didn't he call one of his relatives during the Diamonds and Pearls thing? I've heard it on I've heard it on YouTube. Yeah, then, I don't know if I, it was from the Diamond and Pearls, but we was in the studio and he called. It, we, we called a few people. Uh, I, <laughs> there was a few people that was called just to be pranking, and he was just like, you know, uh, 
But do you know where something, you know, it's just little shit. In, but he put a different voice on like, um, Yes, on. this is from uh, Warner Brothers Records, and he would put this whole yeah, exactly, voice on. Yeah, exactly, that kind of thing. Oh, shit. I was cracking. I was crying listening to this shit. And then you imagine sitting there with him, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I want to call somebody and do a prank. We're like, you you are? <laughs> <laughs> and he was a hey, practical one joker. Of, one of the things that I took, you know, and, and I've heard a bunch of interviews that you did but one of the things i took from an interview that you did with us when we did our tribute to cap was the memories you know and you were telling the stories like about how you and cat kept in touch and she would send you memes and things like that those types of experiences and memories must be invaluable to you oh man man yeah i, I mean you know cat was you know we we had a different relationship you know because we were just you know, bonded through Prince, you know what I mean? But then she was like, you know, one, she had been in Minnesota. She hadn't really been out nowhere, you know, mm -hmm. without him and was wanting to go do something fun. And we're like, yeah, shit, you know, holler. we'll come pick you up and hang you out, you know, whatever, you know, and we would just go to the club and get our groove on, man, and just yeah. have fun. And that's just with everybody. I mean, everybody in the band, it's like, you know, my relationship with Levi is, is you know, Whenever we see each other, we just start laughing and smiling because it's funny because he he has a nickname. He calls me all the time. And, you know, it was, you know, I, I was like, you know, I just always said bye. And he'd always say, what's up, tripod? And I was like, tripod? What the hell? <laughs> oh, shit. You know what I mean? Not and, and, it. But we have, I, look, there's a story behind it, but I ain't going to get into it. But um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so we had... This different relationship. Me and Miko had a relationship. We used to hang out all the time and stuff. And, you know, I told a story about how him and Prince got into it at one of the rehearsals before we went. And he he blatantly wanted to say I lied about it. But then the video came out and everybody was like, oh, I guess he wasn't lying. Like, no, I remember the day. Stop acting like y'all don't, you know, you're scared to talk about something that happened. And then, well, you don't tell family business. Family business what? Nigga, y'all was getting ready to argue and you, you were late for rehearsal which was the first part of it. Secondly, you got there, he was playing, and he's like, you know, getting the music started, and you weren't in there yet. He's like, what are you doing? And y'all got into that little back and forth, and y'all went into that whole little, oh, no, you ain't. You ain't going to do this. You ain't going to do that. Nah, 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 nah. I quit. No, you can quit. You fired. Nah, nah, nah. Nigga, what what'd you say? And, and Right. I've, I've, seen I've seen it. So y'all didn't fight because Levi broke y'all up before it happened. Okay, no, you didn't fight, but y'all had words and y'all was headed outside to do it. Because he was going to make a point to you that he ain't scared of you. <laughs> and, and I'm not Prince now. <laughs> right. So, you know, I mean, it, everybody had a relationship in certain ways. And and, and and trust me, I'm the last person that anybody want to have to say anything because I don't re forget shit. I'm like that elephant. I don't forget right. shit. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm, I guess I guess you can call me the 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 loaded gun or mm -hmm. mother. You don't nobody want to say shit to because they like I'm gonna say what the fuck it is because I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like I I'm gonna always be respectful, right? Of Prince, I'm gonna always honor that brother for what he gave me. I'm gonna never disrespect his legacy. I'm sorry, that's just not what it is for me. Sure, you know, in my heart, I'm always gonna give him the praise that he. I wouldn't be where I am. Y'all wouldn't even know me if it wasn't for him. Right. Right. You right. know what I mean? So I don't say nothing against him that ain't no good. But at the same time, he's still a human. Yeah. There was shit that he did that probably pissed some people off. Yeah. There was shit that, you know, went on between him and whoever else, uh, you know, one of the other people in the band, and they, you know, they they got into a little argument and it was about money and this and this and that. But then you know, you're mad about it. Yeah, well, man, he owed me this and he owed me that, and then, and then something happens, like him passing, and then y'all, y'all's your best friend. And I'm sorry, I'm just not into that kind of shit. I don't pull. I'm, I'm not fake. I will yeah. never be. No, you're not. Yeah. I'm gonna be as straight as it is about it. You know, whatever the issues were, when, when you're dealing with that brother, he wasn't perfect. Nobody is. Yeah. Did he have? Some 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 agendas where shit didn't you know fit right for certain people. Yes, there was things that was happening with other people. Whatever whatever that is, I don't know all the story. No. I know what I dealt with him, and right. I did that I've had with him. And you can speak and and, and I'm not scared to say the shit. 
You know, I tried to write a book. I My first time getting ready to write the book, I brought it to him to let him look at it. Yeah. Okay? This was back after, way after I was out of the band. I was just kind of going through a divorce and, and had a bunch of shit going on. My life was, wasn't, was you know, I mean, I and, and I'm saying this now, and I don't care what nobody would think. Back then, I didn't make money. I, the money I made being a part of the band was my salary. Right. I didn't make that extra money writing no damn lyrics. I didn't make no extra money writing, helping write the song. I didn't get no damn credit for helping create what was on stage. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even get a motherfucker to think that I could sing, would give me an opportunity to sing. I sung some little background vocals. That's why it says on the album, Damon, dancer, choreographer, background vocal. Right. right. Okay. But I wasn't nobody giving me no opportunity to sing, like to sing lead or sing a part or rap. Nobody was giving me that opportunity. And I didn't take it that way. I was there doing my part. Right. So I didn't make no extra money. So fast forward, Prince was, you know, calling me up years later just to hang out. Right. This is our, this was my relationship with this brother. Okay? When I was there, whenever he talked to me about stuff, when we were in the band, he would say, hey, well, what are you up to on this and this and that or whatever? He, you know, just shooting the breeze talk. Yeah. And we just had conversations. So when I got out of the band and I was I was working at a daycare, actually, is what I was doing. I was working with oh, wow. kids. Wow. And he calls and, you know, getting this call on the phone and, oh, uh, hey, this is Prince. I'm like, uh, nigga, where'd you get my number from? <laughs> he knew where everybody was even after you left the band. Even after you left. And I was like, I was like, well, yeah, I'm just chilling, man. I don't know what you're doing. Uh, wow. can you come on? Hey, Lee. Uh, sure. When you want to do it. Uh, whenever you can, just let me know when you can go. I was like, okay. Uh, I don't know how I'm gonna let you know. I don't, you ain't got no number. This is a block number. Ain't it? <laughs> and he's like, well, just come out or whatever. And we get together and we just talked about shit. Yeah. Okay. Everyday life, what's going on with you, what you're doing nowadays, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, so when I started writing this book, I had a young lady who I had just met. Her name was Ursula. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, to, you know, if she writes. And she's like, yeah, so while I'm writing this book. I need you to help me with my grammar and different stuff, whatever. So we get this thing finished. And now, mind you, this is around the time he was starting in the Jehovah Witness thing and the religious stuff so we're sitting there and he goes you know had me come out to um the kingdom hall <laughs> and i brought the book with me now i didn't know um that at the time you know ursula was telling me you know larry graham was around whatever then i you know i'm not yeah yeah i i wasn't familiar with larry i i honestly didn't know who larry was um until later in life, but then I was like, oh, oh Larry Graham, yeah. Graham Central Station, blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah. So he, uh, she let, she let Larry look at the book. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the conversation was between them, but when um, Prince, you know, I got to, to the Kingdom Hall and we were sitting there, you know, he tried to get me to come up to the front where he was sitting at. And I was like, nah, dude, I'm, I'm good back here. <laughs> Yeah. I'm gonna stay in the back of the church, bro. And he leaves and we go mm -hmm. outside and I say, hey man, I want to, you know, I want you to check something out for me and let me know what you think. So he I hand him the book and he said, What what's this? I said, I said, it's a, a book that I'm trying to do, you know, so I can have something um, you know, uh, writing about my life and stuff or whatever. And he goes, Oh. And he leaves. Two minutes later, he's called me back and he's like, Hey, where you at? And I'm like, I'm still over by the Kingdom Hall. He's like, don't go nowhere. I'll be right back. Cool. He comes back, pulls up in the lot. He said, get in the car. I'm like, all right. I get in the car. And he's like, so tell me why you're writing this book. And I looked at him. I was like, well, you know, I got kids, man. They've never been around all the stuff that I'm doing. And I want them to, you know, be able to read about what their dad has done, right. you know, uh, Plus, I got family that have never, you know, never even, I mean, they knew I was in there, but they don't know any of the stuff. And he goes, oh, uh, well, you know, I got 
people writing stuff about me all the time. And I was like, uh, but this is about me, not you. And he goes, well, you know, uh, I think it was Vanity. I think it was Vanity that he said was writing a book and he had to have his lawyer stop her or some shit, he said. Yeah. And I looked at him and I was like, uh, okay, so what does that mean? I said, did you read the book? He said, I read the first two pages. I said, oh, so you read the uh, introductory and the, the dedication, the thank you. And he's like, well, uh, I mean, I read some of the stuff. And so in my mind, I'm not I'm not hearing him. And I, and I believe what he was saying was he already knew about the book through Larry. Mm. And I was sitting there like, okay, <sighs> I'm confused. I said, so you read the first two pages. So you read the name of the book. And you read the dedication that I dedicated this book to my mother, my grandmother, who was the reason I'm here, and you for the opportunity that was given to me. And he's like, well, I just don't think you ought to do it. And I'm like, can you tell me why? He said, well, I don't want to have to have my lawyers come at you. We're like family. You're not supposed to have any. I mean, you probably shouldn't write anything anyway because you signed an agreement when you were in the band that you would never talk about me. And I went, I said, you talking about... You talking about when I, in 1990, we're in 2000, nigga. <laughs> yeah, hey. You still holding that against me? I'm like, mm. cool, man, I won't write the book. He said, well, I'm just saying we're like family and you don't need to do that if you need some money or something. I said, man, I don't need no money, man. That's not why I'm doing this. Right. I said, now, I really would appreciate it if you just tell me that you read the book, honestly. Right, right. You know, and tell me a reason why you don't think it's a good book. I mean, it, it, it has not. I said, if you read it, you'll see that you are the reason that I am known through every through your community. Right. And he just went, well, I just don't think you should do it. And that was the last thing I was like, okay, bro. And I left that day. Two days later, he calls me, <laughs> and he's like, "What are you up to?" I'm like, "Nothing, dude. Over here at this daycare." Dealing with these kids. And he's mm. like, can you come out to Paisley? And I'm like, for what, man? I said, well, why don't you just tell me what it is you want to do, man, or whatever. And he's like, well, just come to Paisley. And I went out there and we started talking. And the brother says to me, uh, you know, he, he, you know, just went into this whole religious thing and, you know, stuff. And I was just like, I get it, man. I get it. You don't think I should write a book. If I need something, you would want to you, you want to help me, but you're not telling me what kind of help you want to give me. I said, but I'm not asking you for anything, dude. I'm letting you know that I've always had your back. I don't care what nobody would say. If somebody says I'm out of line about you, I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna set them straight because right. what I've experienced with you was, has been nothing but loyalty, and you've shown me a different side of life. There's the magic like, word. And you know, the and he just word. looked at me. He just mm -hmm. kind of had this this blank stare on his face, man. And he just mm -hmm. kind of was like, well, I, I just didn't want you to feel like you had to write a book if you need some money. And I looked at him and I was like, dude, I'm, I don't want anything from you. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. yeah. You know, now, yeah. if I'm thinking about that now and, and, and forward here, back then, I think maybe he was, maybe he thought I should have asked him for something. And it almost sounded like he wanted me to say, well, can you help me, man? I'm, I'm, I'm down on my luck. But that's not the kind of person I was. And that wasn't what I felt like with him. You know, we, yeah. we had many conversations about shit. I mean, he even said to me then about people that had to work with that he felt like, you know, they, they're, they're trying to, you know, they, they're, they're doing all this stuff because they think I, I, I did something to him. And I, I was like, I just stopped him. I was like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about nobody else. Right. That's between you and them. So the question said, leads to, to me. I'm is, loyal. Right. Look, and that's and I wanted to bring that word back up in the conversation, and then I and when I have a question for you to follow that. So loyalty. When I discuss this with Bean, actually, and we, we had a discussion about Larry Graham that I will tell you off the air. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to say it here. Um, yeah. I don't know Larry personally, so I can't speak to to ever having met met him or spoke to him and all that. But I know a lot of people have a Larry Graham story in the Associates. Yeah. But yeah. the word that you brought up, loyalty, 
If you if if anybody wants to learn anything about black culture, that word means more than money, than anything. And I think maybe if I interpret it this way, that Prince felt like that perhaps maybe his loyalty was your loyalty was being called into question, and that he did not want that currency taken away from him. Does that yeah, does that kind of I mean I I don't know what he's thinking and you know but. You know, anybody, all the people that have been involved in, with him, and, and as a, like I said, it, it you know, everybody had their own perspective of how they dealt with Prince, uh, what they felt, sure. um, you know, was wrong or something that went on that they felt like, you know, oh, man, I felt like he did this and that. You know, I didn't have any of that. Yeah. It wasn't about no fucking money. I'm sorry for cursing, but I don't, I don't believe in that shit. For yeah. me my loyalty was you hired me to come do a job i'm gonna do my my utmost to make this shit happen i'm gonna i'm gonna do the best within my ability to make your show you know what you want it to be i'm gonna do whatever i gotta do you know if that you you yeah. tell me jump this high this is what i'm gonna do yeah. back then did i think about money no, because I had no clue what fucking um, salary was going to look like for me being a part of that. I knew working a, a, a nine to five. Sure. I was like, I'm working. I do all this. He's out with that money at the end of the week. I'm counting what I know I'm supposed to yep. get. Yep. Getting in his band, I never thought about, you know, hey, I'm trying to make this kind of money. Right. And I don't think nobody did yeah. until you get in that position where you're making money. Now, again... I ain't bashing nobody and I don't care, you know, all the people that have been a part of the band. Everybody that was a part of the band that I was in made decent money. Yeah. Not just their salary. They made decent money outside of that. Yeah. Okay. And to sit there and be the type of people that, you know, you you, you made all this money, he gave you these opportunities. And, mm -hmm. and again, I, not naming nobody and not trying to put nobody on blast, but you made money, but I got a fucking newspaper handed to me when I was working at the daycare. Right. And Lovega said, hey, these people are suing Prince. I said, for what? And they like, well, they were yeah. former band members. Now I'm like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> and yeah. hearing that and then hearing shit that I hear and stories and then running across people and you're going, Seriously? So you motherfuckers would go so far as to claim that he owes you money, this and that, but yeah, that's your boy. It's your yeah. boy. Oh, he's my friend. Yeah. <laughs> so friendship means shit to you, but loyalty is a different story. Right. Story. It's a deeper, you it's hear deeper me? level. Yep. That's why it pisses me off when I hear people talk about Kirk. And I'm a, and I'm throw Kirk's name in here because that's my brother. That's my little brother. I, I I love that dude with every ounce of my my being. Tony, love the brother with every ounce of my being. If there's shit that happens between people, there should be a communication. There should be some kind of talk. There should be some kind of, let's get yeah. this out on the table. Yeah. With Kirk, I know that everybody had all these attitudes about what happened when P died and all that other right. shit. Oh, his name was on a bottle, blah, 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 blah. You right. ain't you don't know shit. You don't know right. Kurt. No. You ain't living in his shoes. You ain't been around him like I have. Kurt would never hurt a fucking fly. Mm. Okay? If a mm. mosquito was trying to get blood out of that nigga and he just knew that motherfucker kept coming, Kirk ain't gonna kill it. He'll shoo it off and keep moving. <laughs> he ain't that kind of person. So it pissed me off when I hear people talk and they say shit. And oh man, that motherfucker. Don't say that shit around me. Because you ain't got to worry about Kirk. Kirk don't give a fuck what you say. I might punch you in your mouth. Same thing I told Prince about people that come around him and you motherfucker want to start some shit with him. I said, dude, don't worry. See that little black nigga over there in the corner? He might be the one punching. That's loyalty. <laughs> There's the loyalty. Damien There's the loyalty. Right. See? Right. And I and I I don't get into that. It's like, you know, and, and Kirk don't, you know, he don't do no interviews. He won't talk to nobody about anything and that stuff. And I and I I don't blame him and I and right. I I feel him, yep. you know, cause Kirk, Kirk, his demeanor, and I told, me and Kirk talk every once in a while and I say it to him all the time, I said, dude, I wish I had some of you and me mm -hmm. because I, 
I speak my mind. I don't give a fuck. You get come up me the wrong way and we're gonna have it out. Yeah. You might not like it verbally, but you can come meet me face to face. You ain't gonna do nothing. You ain't gonna do nothing unless you walking up to me and punching me in my mouth right while you walking up. You yeah. better keep stepping. <laughs> I've I've never met Kurt, but I've met Kathleen his his sister. And saw on Prince Night in 2022, I actually saw the, they, they, they have a vocal group, right? His sister and a couple of them had a vocal group, and they sang the national anthem at Prince Night. Oh, and, you're talking about me fellas. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Yep. And I'm telling you what, they gave that old school church version of the national anthem to the to the Prince Night baseball game, with Twins versus the Yankees. I can clearly remember the, the game, too. Uh, Yankees yeah. won, but, you know, we, 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 yeah. maybe we'll... You know, but uh, it was a beautiful day, too. And, and you know, I had a lovely conversation with her, actually, um, uh, through a fr mutual friend, a uh, person who was sitting, dog sitting for her. And yeah. uh, she was lovely, lovely to chat with, you know. But I was still, I could tell I was still being vetted. Is this guy just trying to get to know? So, and I get that. I, listen. Mm -hmm. You know, I have I have honor and loyal and respect and, and loyalty to all the things that you're talking about. I certainly can say that same for Jay. We're we're yeah. loyal to 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 the respect. It's yeah. a, respect is a two way street. We ex also in turn expect to be respected because I'm a professional musician. I know where I speak, and I know Jay is professional in his field. So we 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 honor you. We honor Prince. We honor all the associates because we weren't in that world, but we're here to help. Yeah carry that narrative through and, 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 you know, connect the dots. Yeah. I and mean, fill I, in these you know, and, I, and, 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 and as you speak of Kirk's sister, I mean, they his whole family is talented. I mean, yeah. all his sisters sang. Yep. Only one that I know that didn't, that I didn't know of that even played in was his, his brother who was older than him. But man, you talk about, I mean, Kirk's an extremely talented dude. And a lot of people don't know all the back, stuff that he does producing and writing oh, yeah. and doing other stuff he does programming um, drums for which prince i said Taylor. that's why prince kept him around yeah but prince knew how talented was prince and kurt was like that mm -hmm. there's, there's no way song. that he's brother would have him be yeah. the best man at his freaking wedding he's name checked in my computer on the emancipation album when my brother kurt calls you know, hope you get together soon. I mean, he's he's freaking name checked in a goddamn song. I mean, yeah, that's a gesture yeah. of loyalty in itself. Yeah, it's like yeah. I see you, brother. I see you. I'm gonna put your name in a song because he they were working heavily at that time together. Well, I, I tell you, I, I cannot, and I know Jay and I cannot express in the words. When we had you on as an extra guest, I said to Jay immediately, I said, we got to get Damon on for his own episode, and we wanted you on. I said he's no just special guest. You're not the man behind the car. You, you, you. We wanted you front and center, man, and we appreciate you coming yeah. on our little humble little podcast here and just shedding I, some I, light. Last minute, so much. I think that you know we were we were trying to schedule things, and Kirk and I, have, uh, Kurt and I, have been doing a bunch of interviews, and we said let's call Damon, and we appreciate you being right there for us and uh, coming yeah. at the last minute too, because I, 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 yeah. I was supposedly had to have a rehearsal down in uh, Baltimore for a, a band I'm involved in, and just things mm. happen with the gig. We'll talk about it later, but I, I said, Jay, I, I'm actually free on Friday. See if see if we can make this happen. And we appreciate just taking your time out. Oh, this man. and yeah, and just... it's it's all good, man. I, I I don't mind. I mean, you know, I've, I've always and, and like I said, I think there's people that that get a little nervous when they hear that I'm on something or they going to say something or oh, you got that motherfucker out here again. You know, I have my, my issues with, with certain people and I just kind of, you know, I, I'm going to say what it is on me because I, I, you know, I, I have love for all of them and I always put everybody on a pedestal before I say myself, like I said, I just found out this year that I was the only person in that band that didn't really write or get a song written or wrote a song or get made extra money. I, this year was like been an enlightenment for me. You know what I mean? It was like mm -hmm. when it was told that stuff, I was going, wait, so you mean to tell me out of everybody in that band, I'm the only person that didn't didn't get to write a song, didn't get to be make no extra money to do this other stuff? And I'm going, and they said, well, you know, Mike K had an album. I say, 
And I love my take. She's like a little sister. I said, my take got an album? She said, yeah. I was like, sure. you're fucking kidding me right now. Child of the Sun. <laughs> and I, yep. I was blown away. Yep. And I was just like, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, and I'm just throwing this out here because four or five years ago when they asked me not to be a part of the MPG no more, I was being this team player and I kept thinking, geez, you know, y'all want me to sit out? And it's like, okay, well, I guess I will. You know, that's what's going to you know help the band and help us get more, generate yeah. more income. Yeah. And only to find out later that it was all financial. You know what I mean? We're letting yeah. promoters tell us who we could and could not hire. And I went, right. yep. huh? That's yeah, before you and I, before be, you were the first person that came on the Zoom link that I had sent, and and I'll, I'll we'll talk a little bit more detail. But basically, I said to you, you know, when I worked in the opera world for many years, mm -hmm. that the orchestra got their bag, us choristers on stage. I was a background singer essentially, and I had roles and little bit roles in operas and stuff at the Kennedy Center for 14 years of my life. And we had, it, depending on the production, we didn't always have dancers on stage, corps de ballet, okay? Classically trained ballet singers, some of them also were into the music that I, you know, what we're talking about right now. But if you had taken the ballet dancers out of certain productions that we did, it wasn't the same performance. And you I yeah. you had mentioned recently you went to see Beyonce not the, a couple of years ago. Yeah. And you have a buddy who works for Beyonce as a dancer. Is that correct? Right. So no, you, you he's, know a, where... he's a production. He's a production, production guy. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's what you were telling me. And if Beyonce didn't have her bevy of performers, you, when you go to see a show, either you, sometimes you can go see a group and you're all, it's all about the music. If I go to see Yes, I'm not looking for fucking background dancers on that kind of thing because I know what kind of music I'm going to. OK, exactly. but if I'm exactly. going to see a review where dancers were a part of the the production of the song and the, and the show, I want to see the dancers on stage. If if Cat were still alive and the Love Sexy Band got back together, somehow Sheila and her reconciled whatever their whatever was going on there, let's say in, a, in an alternate universe. If you had taken her out. Of that whole thing. And there was a tribute to the Love Sexy Band. Wouldn't mm -hmm. be the same thing. Be the same. Right. No, I'm just no, saying. No, I'm just no, making a comparison here to what you gave to the NPG. And I was at one of the NPG shows where you're not part of Mackenzie who sings for them. And though it was it was an entertaining show and your musicianship, certainly, as you know, was there. But I mean, I brought a friend, a very close friend of mine to that show. We we went to see Love Sexy together back in the eighties. There was clearly something missing without you there. I'm just going to say yeah. it. I'll say it right here. I mean, like I said, man, I, 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 that time being told that and then finding out what I find out later and then feeling like I was feeling about it. And I was like, you know, I had a, you know, my, my, my so called best friend, my, my, my guy, you know, Tony, who's part of it. And, you know, the way the scenario came down, it was like you asked me to sit out and then, yeah. You tell me, and and this was straight from Morris's Morris Hayes's mouth, is well, man, you got a job, and I talked to him. And I said, I said, so Tony got a, a regular job too, and he goes, yeah, you know, and so they you just kind of blow that off, and I'm going, oh, okay, so Tony M wrote music, yeah, he wrote wrote songs with friends, so that stands out more than me being a part of it, so. I had to swallow some pride, and especially when I got the message from their manager to say, well, we can do a show without you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, wow, yeah, you're right, you can. You yeah. really can. And it took me some time to, to understand why it was being said to me and, you know, what that meant for me going forward, you know. So now, like I said, man, I don't have no hate for nobody on that stuff. I just like shady shit from anybody. And if you're gonna talk to me, talk to me like you got good damn sense. Don't say no dumb shit that makes me question who the fuck you are and what you're trying to come at me like. Just say, hey, we're not making enough money, and we, you know, we can only, you know, got this many people that we can pay to bring out on the road with us. And then don't turn around and and bring out a fucking extra two horn players and an extra singer. 
right. when you could have been paying my black ass to sit up on the stage and dance and, and keep the energy alive. But no, hey, let your horn players go. Let your singers go do the thing and everybody do be happy. So I had to learn what that meant to me, you know, and then the, only to find out that my, you know, my guy I thought was my friend was that I, 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 I don't know where the fuck we are at this point in life because we ain't talked since all that shit. <laughs> is Sorry to hear that. you didn't have my back is what I what I feel from that. It's like you was my boy. Why didn't you tell them like, no, nah, dude, that ain't cool. We can't do that to be. Well, we but got maybe that's back not here, what it was man. supposed to be. Maybe yeah. that's what the styles lined up to be, and that's what life. You know, it's like you 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 feel the energy, and you go, okay, you know what? Yeah, it wasn't meant for me to be that. Yeah, well, we're sorry, and you'd be sorry. okay with that. I know what I bring to the table as far as the energy level and what I want the people in the audience to see. I know what I bring on that level. I can't make anybody else see that. I can't make the people that are making the music that's doing the show see that that's an important feature in some sense. I can't. The one person that that felt like that was something important, he's no here, he's not here no more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, that's what I will take, you know, with me moving forward, is that that brother wanted me to be a part of that. That brother felt like my energy is, would help. That brother felt like us three brought that energy, not just one person. Yeah, and well, that's where we see that. Yeah. So you know, for me, I don't, I don't, I appreciate what you're saying, Kurt. I, yeah, I do. I, I, I do appreciate I, I the do. fact that you know people will go to a show and say, "Well, it's not the same without you being there." Yeah, but it still can do a show without it. It doesn't mean that they're not going to stop. <laughs> no, I. I <laughs> you know what I, I mean. It, 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 it is the music business and the business and sometimes screws a lot of people over and, and tests a lot of loyalty, but it's business. I, but what, yeah. did, what did Billy Sparks say? It's a business, man. Business. You ain't too far gone to see that. Well, we're not too far gone to see that it ain't over with us, with us uh, and, and you, Damon, we, we're going to definitely have you back on when your book comes out. And we yeah. hope that's kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm already, Let's just say I'm I'm a little over a quarter away in uh, with everything from the, my beginning, you know, being born and all that, you know, because I was a premature, I was a preemie baby. So <laughs> oh, you're you're here for I was a, a preemie baby that wasn't really supposed to be here because you know back in the south they wasn't trying to have black kids born. <laughs> oh, we let me tell you, well, we're we are we are honored that you you spent your time with us. So. I uh, want to say, folks, if you liked what you heard and saw today and you got the gospel of 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 Reverend, right, Reverend Dixon, that's what I'm going to call you, right, Reverend, from now on. You got your own nickname around here at the Electric Vibe. Uh, please hit the <laughs> like and subscribe button below. And 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 it's really to, to, to my usual sign off before we before we end. This is usually a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's I, I always feel like that that's a message that applies just about any conversation. And thank you for giving the electric and the electric vibe here with us today. Uh, oh, Jay, man. Appreciate y'all having me on, man. You and Jay, y'all ain't uh, got nothing but love for me, bro. And love to you too, man. Right back. And so uh, in closing, I want to say, Damon Dixon, thank you very much. It ain't over. I know you're going to be back with us, particularly when the book comes out. But I'm sure we're going to be seeing you, uh, you know, in between. And like I always say, everyone, um, when the universe comes knocking, make sure that you answer that door. Peace. Yellow! Yes.